Good afternoon. Um, I'm here to announce that there are 24 new Tulsa County cases, bringing our total of COVID-19 positive cases to 175. I am pleased to report that we now have 20 people who are, we've officially called recovered from COVID-19. And it's important to understand that most people who become infected will experience mild symptoms and they will recover. Some individuals, primarily those, those at-risk groups we've talked about in the past, are older demographics, those with um, immune compromised uh, conditions or underlying health conditions, will probably require hospitalization because their illness will be more serious. Um, and I say that because unfortunately, we are reporting three additional people who have died from complications of COVID-19 in Tulsa County, bringing our total of deaths to eight. Um, this week, Tulsa Health Department conducted specimen collection for COVID-19 testing at our mobile sample collection site at a confidential uh, location by appointment only. We remind everyone as resources remain limited at our department, if you have insurance, please call your health care provider. In Tulsa County, the hospital systems continue to test their patients. Our mobile testing site is to serve those who are pre-screened, high-risk individuals who are un- or underinsured. If this is you, please call the Tulsa Health Department for screening to determine if you are eligible or if you need to be tested. All of our samples go to the Oklahoma State University Lab for testing. We appreciate everyone who's been involved with these collections, including the residents who have appointments and have been tested. It's going very well. We've been really pleased with how, how well our mobile testing sites have been functioning. As soon as we get more resources to do testing, we will scale those operations up. We are working with the city of Tulsa to coordinate local donations from industries and businesses. As we receive items, we are prioritizing them for distribution to local healthcare systems and responders according to a tiered system. If you are a business interested in contributing items like gloves, N95 masks, or other supplies, please visit cityoftulsa.org. As a reminder, during this vulnerable time, scammers are taking advantage of the anxiety surrounding coronavirus. Beware of claims from people claiming to be from CDC or other experts if you haven't subscribed or received, previously received information from them. Please know that Telsa Health Department will never ask for money or ask for your personal information over the phone or an email. Ironically, National Public Health Week kicks off Monday. It's great timing to appreciate all of our staff who have been extremely involved in this response. Public health is, of course, what, part of what we do is to respond to pandemics like this, but we also wear many other hats and many other faces. We are nurses helping new moms get resources that need to start their baby's life outright. I'm giving public health a shameless plug now. We are protecting you and your family with vital immunizations to live a healthy life. We are inspectors who make sure your rented homes and apartments are in livable conditions. We are the educators who go to your child's school to teach about active lifestyles and making personal responsible choices about their bodies. Over the last few weeks, we've had to modify some of the services and how we provide our services, but please know that our essential services are still here for you. Our WIC offices are able to serve you online and over the phone without a visit to the office. Bottle records is also available online for birth and death certificates. Our food inspectors are still here making sure our food supply remains safe. We encourage you to support our local restaurants and bakeries with a peace of mind knowing our sanitarians are still working with in innovative ways that restaurants are um, using to stay open for business. Our staff is still conducting routine inspections, reaching out to restaurants by phone or in-person visits to offer food safety consults and to review their cleaning procedures to keep your family fed, safe, and well. Our goal in public health is to support Tulsa's to be happy, healthy, and thriving. Health ex experts this week have been sharing more about modeling. Modeling is done to show potential scenarios, best case, worst case, and what we think is most likely. It helps guide our response and future planning for these potential scenarios. Modeling the spread of COVID-19 is trying to model exponential growth. And to give you a little example of what that truly means, one way to really understand what exponential growth is, if you start with one penny and you double your money every day, at one week you'll have 64 cents. At two weeks, you'll have $81. At three weeks, you'll have over $5,000, and by 30 days, you'll have over $5 million. 
the longer the doubling goes on, the exponentially bigger this response and this pandemic gets. When we do modeling, we use an R0 value, and this stands for how many people will get infected by one sick person. If the R0 value is two, that means for every single infected person, they infect two more people, and the number of people who are infected grows extremely fast. And the money, as you saw in our example, did as well. If people stay home and do not interact with anyone outside of their household, we can use an R0 value of one in our models, and it shows us a scenario that has significantly fewer infections. In modeling, it's extremely hard to know the exact R0 value within the community, so we use different values. And, mod and we model different scenarios to try and understand the potential scope of this issue. Bottom line, the more people who stay home and limit outside interactions, the fewer people who become infected. And we can adjust our models to be more narrow and ultimately more accurate. I'd like to introduce Mayor Bynum at this time. Thank you, Dr. Dart. Uh, I want to start by thanking my colleagues on the Tulsa City Council who on Wednesday took very swift action uh, that will allow us to open uh, the expansion shelter for our homeless community that uh, the city of Tulsa is opening in partnership with Tulsa County, uh, with the Day Center for the Homeless, the Salvation Army, and the Ann and Henry Zero Foundation. I'm really thankful for the Tulsa City Council for taking action on that so quickly. I also want to thank my colleagues in our neighboring cities who over the last week have taken very courageous action and implemented their own shelter in place initiatives. Uh, I know personally how hard a uh, decision that is to make and I'm very grateful that they put the lives of our uh, fellow Oklahomans ahead of anything else. Uh, it, it makes all the difference in the world when we're in such an unprecedented time to know that we're not alone in this and that our neighbors are right there with us in making those sacrifices necessary to save lives and, and protect uh, our, our fellow Tulsans. Um, I, I really want to thank all Tulsans as well for the way everyone in our community uh, or most people in our community over the last week have handled this unprecedented time. When you look at uh, where we are in the overall progression of this virus as best we can tell based on uh, confirmed cases but probably more importantly because there's still uh, so much testing to be done looking at uh, deaths from this we know that we're in the early stages and, and we've benefited from being in the middle of the country and seeing cities on the coasts that are far further into this event than we have been uh, and a, a lot of them waited far longer into the spread of the virus within their community to take action uh, as compared to what we've done here in Tulsa. Uh, we took action early because that's what all of the public health guidance uh, that we could find gave us, that the earlier you act, uh, the better your odds are of having a healthcare system that can handle this. So I really want to thank everybody in town who's taking this seriously, who's practicing uh, social distancing, uh, the businesses who are sacrificing, the employees who are sacrificing right now. Uh, you're sacrificing so that people will be able to have their lives saved in our community. And I'm incredibly grateful for the way that people in Tulsa have handled this over the last week. Uh, it, it's not something that we have a lot of experience with. We've never had to do this in the history of our city. And we know that there's a lot that we can be doing to get better at it as we go, but I think we are getting better each day. And I'm just very grateful uh, for the sacrifices that everybody in town is making right now. Uh, we get a lot of questions and have received a lot of questions over the last week about, you know, can I do this or can I do that? For, I would say to that two things. One, uh, you can go to the cityoftulsa.org website and right at the top you'll see a box that pops up that says COVID-19. You click on that and it takes you to the, the real focal point for information on this event as it relates to the city of Tulsa. On that page, there's a frequently asked questions link that you can click on. Uh, I go to it uh, routinely throughout the day when people are asking me questions uh, to look up things. Anybody can use it. Uh, and it has a lot of the questions that you might be asking or that might be coming to mind. You can just go there and, and get that guidance immediately. The, the other thing that I would say, though, is under this order, in being mindful 
of how much people in our community who are taking this seriously are sacrificing to slow the spread of this virus um, is that if you, if you have to ask, the answer is probably that you shouldn't be doing it. Um, there's, it's really pretty simple as far as the things that people should be out of their homes to do. Getting food, taking care of their health, going to a job at an essential workplace as defined by the state of Oklahoma, and that's about it. Uh, if it's not one of those three things, then you should be at home. And not just for you, if, if you don't care about your own personal health, that's your business. But this is about preventing people from spreading this unknowingly to other people in our community. So far, the, the, the science around this shows that somebody can have this between five and 13 days before they even have symptoms. You think about all the people you care about, uh, would you want to be the person that is unknowingly making them ill and giving them this potentially deadly virus? I would hope not. And so if you don't want to be that person, uh, then practice social distancing and follow uh, the shelter in place order that has been put out there. But also say that for the folks that aren't following this, you're putting our first responders in danger. And uh, at this point in the city of Tulsa, uh, we have about 3,700 employees that work at the city. Uh, we have 57 different employees in quarantine right now, uh, and one employee who's tested positive for COVID-19. Um, I'm very grateful for the quick action of the Tulsa Health Department in letting us know anytime there's a positive case. They do a really good job at, at looking to see if there's been any exposure to one of our first responders so that our first responders can identify that particular situation and then trace back anyone that might have had contact and, and they can be quarantined immediately uh, for observation. Uh, and I also want our, our police officer who uh, contracted this virus, if he sees this, I hope he knows that everybody on our team at the city is thinking about you and praying for you. Um, now I'd like to turn this over to Fire Chief Ray Driscoll. Thank you, Mayor. Well, I tell you, first of all, it, it, uh, I thought I had a tough job until I got to see the Mayor and Dr. Dart perform, and I really appreciate their leadership and everything that they've done. I would also like to echo some of the things that he said about this is a community issue and we've all got to work together with what's going on. In particular, I want to mention a few things within the Tulsa Fire Department. First of all, our staffing. Our staffing is doing a very good job at an academy that was going to graduate about April 14th. We actually graduated those folks uh, last this past week. Uh, that's going to be very helpful that we have those folks out on the trucks. When you look at the additional staffing that we already had out there, we had quite a few of our firefighters who were turning back their vacation so that they could come help the public, and we appreciate that. That's a sacrifice that they're making, but it's also sacrifices that a lot of, a lot of other people have made as well. But we've got to make those sacrifices to ensure that we take care of the community, which is what we do. When you look at supply inventory, we're doing pretty good, whether it's masks, gowns, gloves, uh, but we do have stuff on order, and we do need that stuff to come in. But for the most part right now, we're in pretty good shape. When you look at the types of calls and the number of calls, our fire calls have been pretty steady. Uh, the EMS calls have dropped a little bit, but we do anticipate that to go up. The reason they drop is the NPDES codes that we use. We've dropped some of those, so we're only responding to the life-threatening calls. Uh, but we do anticipate that to go up going forward. Uh, when it comes to quarantine, we've got, uh, today we've got four people who are quarantined. We've had as high as 23, and that number varies because people come on and, and drop off at various times. And then the final thing is the cleaning of the fire stations and the equipment. We still clean the fire stations every morning, every evening, and then we have someone come by and, and uh, fog the stations every day. And then we also clean the equipment to ensure that we're, uh, we're taking care of the citizens when we do respond to their calls. At this time, I'd like to introduce Chief Franklin. Thank you, Chief Driscoll. The Tulsa Police Department continues to operate at normal staffing levels. Uh, we are not noticing uh, any ab uh, absenteeism, and, uh, but we do have several officers under quarantine. Uh, our positive case, as was mentioned earlier, and as we uh, mentioned to you earlier this week, we have one officer that remains positive. Uh, that officer is quarantined at home and we have a number of officers that are self-quarantining as well. 
this does not affect our staffing numbers. Uh, we do have sufficient staffing levels to continue services to the city of Tulsa. We are deconning our uh, patrol stations. We're deconning every uh, division within our department and we'll continue to do so. We have enough chemicals on hand to do so. Uh, we appreciate the city of Tulsa uh, for uh, making the chemicals available to us to, to be able to do that. Uh, we also have received a number of different inquiries uh, regarding donations and donations being made to first responders. Uh, we're trying to triage that and, and get a hold of that. So if you are a business or a person wishing to do donations to the city of Tulsa, we ask that you send an email to uh, the email address COVID19donations at cityoftulsa.org. That's cityoftulsa.org. Finally, reports we're continuing to see high call volumes. We continue to have a number of non-emergency calls coming in and we continue to do our service. Uh, with that, we're asking that if there is a report that you can do uh, via uh, the website, we ask that you use that. That's at tulsapolice.org. And we also have the ability to do uh, reports via a telephone reporting officer. Uh, that is simply where you call into our non-emergency and our dispatcher will route you to a, an officer who will then call you back and do the report over the phone. Uh, we're asking that you use that. That keeps us safe. That keeps you safe. Uh, we don't want to introduce that virus. Uh, finally, uh, we continue to enforce the civil order. Uh, we are asking that uh, businesses adhere to it. We're asking that all citizens adhere to it. Uh, this is not something that is uh, uh, that we're trying to uh, force upon someone for the benefit of us. It is solely for the benefit and the safety of you. Uh, I will now turn things over to um, uh, Tulsa County Sheriff Vic Riccolato. Thank you, Chief Franklin. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank our first responders who continue to do an outstanding job despite the added difficulty that this pandemic has brought on. I would also like to give a special thank you to our healthcare professionals who truly are on the front lines of this battle. Please keep them in your thoughts and prayers. The Tulsa County Sheriff's Office continues to follow the sanitizing measures we implemented very early on in the jail. We have also implemented safety pod measures at intake. When we receive a new intake from an arresting agency, that inmate is placed in safety pods for 14 days. They are allowed all the rights and privileges as other inmates, but for the safety of our staff as well as our inmates, they are kept in separate pods for the duration of that 14 days. We continue to allow video visitation, and within the next few days, we will start allowing one free five-minute video visitation per week per inmate. We will announce the time frame in which these calls can be made as soon as we have worked out the details with our vendor. We will uh, keep the public abreast of this uh, through social media and other means. Our deputies continue to respond to calls for service in the field uh, and they are paying particular attention to our businesses that are still uh, operating. I would like to remind our citizens that if you call 911, it is extremely important and vital that you inform our dispatchers whether you or someone in your household has either become uh, potentially infected or is currently under quarantine for the COVID-19. And again, that's for the safety of our, our uh, first responders, but also so that our first responders do not spread that virus uh, as they continue out through uh, their daily uh, work activities. Uh, the Tulsa County Dispatching uh, continues uh, working as normal. However, we have had one of our dispatchers test positive for COVID-19 on our evening shift. Uh, the rest of the shift has been ordered to um, work med and to follow the, the advice and direction of the healthcare professionals as we move forward. We do have plans in place uh, in the event that we need to make up for that evening shift dispatching. Court operations are still taking place in a very limited fashion. Our court guards have been instructed to ask questions of individuals entering into the courthouse to ascertain their risk of exposure. 
Emergency protective orders. During the COVID emergency, the Family Safety Center is closed to the public and cannot help the public with filling out the petition form. That being said, law enforcement in the field will be helping victims fill out those forms. Once completed, law enforcement will deliver the completed petitions and orders for emergency protective orders to the Family Safety Center. The Safety Center will, fill, will still fill the file the original petition and order with the court clerk, then deliver a copy to the Sheriff's Office so that the process of serving the defendant may begin. Remember, the domestic violence victims may still call the Safety Center for telephone counseling. It's extremely important that law enforcement in Tulsa County understand that they must help victims fill out those petitions and, this is the vital part, deliver those filled out petitions to the safety center so that we can begin serving those defendants appropriately. Lastly, it's with a heavy heart that I would like to acknowledge the loss of a beloved and valued member of our Tulsa County Sheriff's Volunteer Cold Case Task Force. Joanne Emmons succumbed to the COVID-19 virus this past Wednesday and left behind her husband of 35 plus years. She will be sorely missed by all who knew her. Our prayers and our thoughts are with her and her family as well as, as with all the people who have died from or are currently fighting this virus. I want to reiterate that it is vital that we continue to follow the directives set forth by the health department, by our governor, by our mayor and county commissioners. As this fight against this virus continues to intensify, we must strengthen our resolve and shove aside petty differences in politics and come together to win this fight and then begin to pick up the pieces afterwards so that those who have paid the ultimate price during this pandemic will not have died in vain. Thank you and God bless us all. Good afternoon. I'm Joe Kralichek. I'm the director of the Tulsa Area Emergency Management Agency, and I just wanted to give you a brief update. Uh, TEMA has activated the Emergency Operations Center for Tulsa to support the health department operations throughout this pandemic event. Uh, we're helping by assisting the coordinating the city and county response to this event in order to make sure that we are being efficient in our resource usage. Uh, we are assisting them with resource management, including setting up a donation center for first responders and hospitals to be able to utilize and collect those resources that are donated more efficiently. Uh, we're also working to ensure that there's a seamless amount of effort put forth between state and federal partners and we're providing the most effective response possible to this pandemic event. At the request of the governor's office, TEMA and the Tulsa Health Department have been working with the United States Army Corps of Engineers on identifying potential sites for alternate care facilities in order to provide planning on, and give options to the governor's office if that is determined to be necessary. Um, earlier, Dr. Dart spoke on models that they use to determine potential rates of spread. We utilize these models to do our planning. Um, in our field, one of the things that you'll hear us say a lot is that we plan for the worst and hope for the best. Oftentimes, that preparing for the worst is the worst of whatever mother nature can throw at us and we really don't have any say in that in this case what is that what can do help us to prepare for the worst and help for the best is if you do your part in order to make the best happen and in order to get this pandemic through the area quickly and not overwhelm the systems we need you to stay home to protect your families, to protect yourselves, to protect our responders and our healthcare workers and all of those people that are out there that have been deemed essential. So do your part and stay home. Thank you. At this time, we will take questions. That's a great question, and that's something that you know we're looking at day by day on this um, because this is something that we've never 
uh, had to do in Tulsa before and never been through. Uh, we're, we're learning as we go and identifying best practices as we go. And so one of the things that's come up uh, is that you do have stores that are necessary for people to be able to utilize. Uh, uh, places to get food, places to get medicine. Uh, one of the frequent ones that gets pointed out to me are, are hardware stores, but the reality is people, and the governor has listed that as an essential business, and the reality is we can't ask everyone to stay home and then not maintain the home in which we're asking them to stay. And so having uh, stores that allow people to maintain their home open is important in this time. Um, but there, there are just common sense, practical things that anyone can do when thinking about going to the store. You know, one, I've heard a, a, you know, concerns about people bringing the whole family to the store. That's just about the worst idea I can think of. Um, you, you should go one person in your household if you, if you have to go to the store, and you should minimize the number of times that you go. Uh, the number of people, you know, we, we, we talk about this, and I'll bring it up again and again. The more people you come into contact with, the greater your odds are of transferring this virus or getting it. And similarly, if you take the whole family to a hardware store or to, or to the grocery store with you, you are, for each person in your family, you're increasing by 100% the, uh, the number of people that could get this and bring it into your household. So I don't know why anyone would think that was a great idea. So what we would encourage people to do is, uh, if you need to go to the store, uh, one, there are lots of delivery services out there, but if you feel like you need to go, send one person. Don't take the whole crew. Um, and then if we get to a point, and I know there are some cities now that are looking at, you know, and we've done this with water rationing in the past in Tulsa, and I think there are even some cities in Oklahoma that are already doing this, you know, designating, you know, based on your address, you know, one day uh, versus another of the week that you would go to the, be able to go to the store or at least encourage people so they have some idea to try and, from a community standpoint, maybe not from a legal regulatory one, but just from a community standpoint, reduce the number of people who go. That's something that we're looking at, but just haven't made any decisions on yet. Uh, again, this order has been in place for six days, and so we want to allow people to, to adjust to it and, and, and see where we need to improve upon it. And that certainly, the, the volume of people that we're seeing go to stores is one of those big ones. Uh, another one that's come up in this area uh, are utilization of trails. Um, and I had a conversation earlier this week with our city parks director uh, and the director of the Tulsa County Parks and the River Parks. And, and what we identified was most of the complaints that were coming in were relative to the trails in River Parks or the trail that goes around La Fortune Park uh, or the parking lot at Turkey Mountain. And so uh, our, those different park organizations that oversee those specific places have put up signage based on discussions they've had with other parks around the park systems around the country, they found that's been helpful, uh, just to remind people to keep that distance. And then in the parking lots, we're looking at coning off spaces so that you don't just have people on top of one another getting in and out of cars in the parking lot at Turkey Mountain. So those are things, again, we're, we're taking this day by day, and we'll evaluate where we need to improve day by day. Okay. From Channel 8, what kind of preparations for a large-scale response, such as a mobile hospital or supply center are happening at sites around the city. Are there plans to turn the areas into al are there plans to turn the area into alternate care sites and if so what do they look like? So uh, the city of Tulsa is involved in that planning but really leading that is Tulsa Area Emergency Management so I'd be happy to turn that over to Joe uh, to give you more details. <coughs> Thank you very much. Can you reiterate the question? Let's see. Um, what kind of preparations for a large scale response, such as a mobile hospital or supply center, are happening at sites around the city? And are there plans to turn the areas into an alternative care site? If so, what would that look like? Uh, we are currently working with the state and federal officials to determine that type of planning. Uh, we have had the Army Corps of Engineers out, and we've been doing site surveys at various locations around town trying to determine ideal locations. We've also been in, in communication with 
all of the area hospital systems to make sure that we're able to coordinate that response and so that it looks like a seamless transition of care. And so you'll receive the same level of care regardless of what, what type of hospital system you go to. Um, and so we are still working through that process. It, we're still in very preliminary stages. And like I said before, it, at this point in time, it's just a preliminary plan that we have just in case. Um, we're doing it at the behest of the governor in order to assist their planning and to give him options on further way, further actions to take. Okay. Um, let's see. I have a couple more questions for you, Mayor. If okay. <laughs> uh, how many playgrounds is the city of Tulsa digging up temporarily to keep people from letting their kids play on them? So uh, we instituted last week a closure of all playground equipment and sports courts in our Tulsa parks. Uh, and you know, most of that is self-monitoring because uh, parents need to know that uh, if you're letting your kid play on playground equipment in one of our Tulsa parks right now, uh, it has not been cleaned and you're endangering your own child by letting them play on that playground equipment. Um, and so we closed that down. And what we found is mostly really strong compliance with that, um, both especially with the playground equipment, but even uh, with sports courts. We ran into some areas where uh, there wasn't such good compliance, particularly with sports courts. And so we sent our park maintenance team out this week to remove the goals off, uh, uh, off basketball courts and things like that. Uh, to discourage people from gathering in those spaces. I couldn't tell you off the top of my head uh, how many facilities we did that were really, it's being driven by reports that we're getting from citizens where there's concerns about people not uh, adhering to the closure of those facilities in our parks. Okay, um, I have questions for Dr. Dart. Great. Thank you. Um, from Fox 23, we get a lot of questions about individual communities and how many cases each city in the Tulsa County are seeing. Is there a way to know city by city when it comes to the Tulsa County area? You know, we, we purposely report cases um, on the county level, uh, and we do uh, internally have the information about where these cases are located um, in cities. We don't like to go any lower than county because if we start getting down to, for example, zip code level, um, when there's smaller populations, specific zip codes, there's a possibility that an in individual could be identified. So we keep our, our reports at, at the county level. We do have that information about what communities um, we're getting cases from, but really the bottom line is that at this juncture, this is widespread. I think every community needs to understand, needs to accept, acknowledge that COVID-19 is in their community, whether they're, they're hearing about positive results or not. Okay, from Channel 6, We've heard at the state level there are some healthcare workers who have tested positive for COVID-19. Is that accurate here as well? Um, as a kid, we don't you know, we don't reveal that kind of information. Bottom line is that we, I mean, our first concern is is at this juncture is keeping our healthcare providers and our first responders healthy, doing whatever we can to assure that they're allowed to to do the work they need to do to protect all the citizens they serve and um, and that that each healthcare system is closely following infection control protocols to assure that their staff are not, are not being infected, not being exposed. Okay, even though the governor loosened the rules on how uh, one can be tested in Tulsa County, can anyone who wants a test get a test right now? You know, at, at this juncture, no, because we still have limited supplies. And, and, I, and I wanna talk a little bit about that because to get a test before you show symptoms really doesn't tell us the information we need to know. I mean, you could be incubating, not showing symptoms, get a test and test negative, knowing that a few days later you might test positive. So just testing everybody at this juncture isn't very helpful. Testing people who are symptomatic is extremely helpful because it's important for us in public health to know where positive are and positive aren't. Eventually, when we can actually ramp it up and we can, because our concern now is, is trying to get a handle on the number of asymptomatic presentations. And so eventually we will be able to do that. Right now we need to focus on, on our most at-risk patients with the limited supplies we've got. Okay, uh, Channel 8, what does the governor's declaration of statewide health emergency affect, how does it affect 
your department's operations? You know, we operate um, the way we do according to our pandemic planning. Regardless, um, we're still finding out if there's anything specific in the governor's de declaration that will affect us specifically, um, not that we know of. Uh, we're continuing to, to do what we do, and that's to respond to this and protect all Tulsa County uh, residents. Okay, that's it for you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chief Franklin. A minor question, but we've been asked by quite a few wives and girlfriends of officers, and even officers, because barber shops and salons are closed. Are grooming standards going to be relaxed temporarily? For the police For, department? Yeah. Yes, sir. Well, again, uh, it's that that's a that's a good question, uh, but no, grooming standards are not being relaxed. Uh, and that's something that we can we can discuss at a later date. Thank you, Chief. Uh, Chief Driscoll. Yeah. Are EMTs doing anything different to sanitize breathing apparatuses after they're being used during calls? And are they even throwing some of the products away after use with someone suspected of being positive for COVID-19? No, we have a cleaning process that cleans all of our equipment, whether it's the SCBA or it's the personal protective gear that they have. So anything that's disposable is being thrown away, but anything that we think is contaminated is being cleaned with an approved chemical to ensure that there's no contamination afterwards. Okay, thank you. And then uh, Rigolato, please. And this is the last question. Are there currently any asylum seekers being held at David L. Moss, and what is federal guidance on the release are you aware of? Uh, we currently have 33. Uh, whether or not they are asylum seekers or those awaiting uh, immigration court or awaiting deportation, I'm not sure on the numbers. Um, as far as the guidelines, uh, the release, my understanding is they're still the same. Um, and they are also um, fall under the same sanitary, sanitize, sanitizing guidelines and other measures that we are taking within the jail. So, uh, so far we have not had uh, one issue um, and they are all being screened prior to being placed in our jail or other holding facilities for, for ICE. Okay, thank you. That's the last question.